Alrighty guys, so uh, welcome to our second Cold War uh, lesson of sorts. Um, so we actually now get to look uh, at a good example of something that you can point to that is a good proxy conflict uh, for the Cold War. So uh, the Korean War, and then we're also diving into stuff in the modern day too, um, because Korea is uh, increasingly um, influential in terms of things like K-pop and then other stuff like that. Um, but it does provide us a good uh, a good moment to kind of revisit nationalism and talk about that as well. Uh, so, um, because we are going to be talking about uh, the Koreas today, um, I'm curious to know what you know about North Korea um, before you even start about you know start getting into the lesson. So just uh, type anything you know. Um, no googling. I just want you to you know go off the top of your head here. Okay. Uh, excellent. So uh, let's talk about then what we're going to be trying to achieve here. So first. Um, we will be going through the broad strokes of the Korean War, um, but we're going to be kind of trying to slot it into the larger context of um, what is going on then in the Cold War. Um, we'll also look at, um, again, just because, you know, every once in a while it seems like problems with North Korea flare up. It's good to know, uh, to be familiar with some of the modern problems that North Korea faces and also causes on the world stage. Uh, and then we'll talk about, again, um, that tie-in of nationalism and uh, kind of an interesting way that we can kind of look at it and measure it. Uh, excellent. So uh, let's talk about, then, the Korean War. Okay. Um, so for a lot of, I guess we'll say, people who like or and enjoy history, um, the Korean War is probably one of the more relatively unstudied ones compared to stuff like Vietnam or World War II. Um, and for that reason, um, we, we will need to spend a little bit of time giving you some context, um, but it does really provide a really good lens into um, how the Cold War is going to interact with institutions like the UN, but then also, like again, this kind of delicate dance that is going to be happening between the United States and the Soviets uh, to avoid things like all-out war. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, let's dive right into it. So during World War II... Okay, so just to, again, just a quick background here. Um, Japan had taken over all of the Korean Peninsula. Okay, um, now after World War II, uh, both the um, uh, both the Soviets as well as then the United States had pushed Japan out of this area. Okay, um, and so after this occurs, okay. Um, there is a decision made just at, you know, again, it's not really given any per se huge amount of thought at, at this time. Okay, you can see, so it's in 1945, there's this choice that's made at the 38th geographic parallel line that they're just going to go ahead for now, divide the country up until things can be, you know, in, until the Koreas can come together and be unified. This isn't really done with any malice per se. Um, it is really done with the thought of we have two armies that, you know, the United States and the Soviets that are sitting right next to one another, you know, one another. Let's just make things simple, cut a clear dividing line. We'll get them together as soon as this whole World War II thing is wrapped up, right? However, once the Cold War starts, um, you know, that dividing line becomes something much more meaningful and serious. And so both the United States and the Soviets are going to set up uh, a North Korea and a South Korea that looks very much like themselves. So we kind of get a Stalinist North that is going to be led by the Kim family. Okay, so you might be familiar with the Kims or Kim Jong-il or Kim Jong-un. Um, Kim Il-sung is the guy here who is going to be um, tapped by Stalin to, to run the country. Um, but then in the south, we get kind of a, a kind of a capitalist uh, South Korea. Um, it's it you know really kind of looks like you know the United States and other countries um, like that. Uh, now, background to all of this, okay, is that with the Cold War going, Stalin is actively encouraging uh, North Korea to attack the South, drive out the Americans, and just go ahead and unify the country under all of North Korea. Um, he provides weapons for it. Uh, he provides planning. Um, and, uh, well, that, that is going to get things rolling. So what is going to happen, and you can watch this on this interactive map up here, is that North Korea um, in uh, 1951 um, is going to pour across uh, the, um, the, the border uh, and invade South Korea. Okay. Now, 
there is something that is happening at this exact um, time that is really, really important for us to talk about, which is um, at this moment, okay, so again, let's just do a quick um, update of world, other things going on in world history at this time. Um, something else has been going on that's kind of significant for us to call out, and that is that uh, China has fallen to communism at this time. Okay, so in 1949 to, through, through the 1950s, um, China is fighting essentially a civil war between the nationalists and the communists. Okay, and so uh, in the early 1950s, China falls to communism. Now, again, just doing a quick rewind here, China was part and is still part of the UN Security Council, okay? So the reason why this matters is because, uh, the, the, if you don't remember, there are five permanent members of the Security Council, right? There's the US, France, Britain, Russia, and then at that time, it was nationalist uh, China. Now, when the communists took over, the United States refused to acknowledge that the uh, that the communist member of the Chinese delegation be seated and be allowed to join the Security Council. And so in protest, the Soviet Union boycotts the Security Council. Okay, now why this all, why, why, why does this all matter? Why am I telling you all this? Um, well, if you don't remember, talking about the UN and learning about the UN in the, in the short lesson that we did, the UN, every single member of the Security Council has what is called veto power, right? So all five security, like all five members of the Security Council have to agree and get the yes vote. Like there can't be any no's for something to happen. So while this is all going on, the Soviets are boycotting it, the Chinese member is not being allowed to be seated, North Korea invades. And at that moment, Truman, who again is the same president that we talked about in the last lesson, he rams through a resolution through the Security Council authorizing the use of force that the UN is going to send troops to go protect South Korea. And because they're both not there for different reasons, the Soviets and the communists, they can't say no, right? And so all of a sudden then we have the first UN troops actually being sent somewhere to protect, uh, you know, to protect you know another country from you know being invaded by another right so this in, in a weird way because the security council at this time was dysfunctional uh the security council the un actually was doing its job um which maybe says a little bit about you know some of the bad parts uh, the you know the, the reasons why the un doesn't work super well in terms of you know uh you know that that veto power that exists between the security council right um that all being said okay uh, when the UN troops arrive, it's mostly United States troops. Um, South Korea is in a really, really bad street. And so, like, I can't show you in the video here because I don't want YouTube copyright to strike me down. But there's basically just this little sliver of South Korea that is left. Okay, um, and the guy who is going to um, the guy who's going to land or be the leader of the U.S. troops in this battle is going to be this guy down here uh, holding the binocs uh, in the middle, and that is uh, Douglas MacArthur. He's this really famous. Uh, World War II general, okay, from the Pacific Theater. Now, MacArthur, we'll talk about him more here in a second, is going to be uh, influential in being the one that is going to uh, be the commander of uh, U.S. and U.N. troops, okay? So, again, you can kind of see here, I, I did I did manage to um, snab a, uh, snag a still here, um, is that MacArthur lands a lot of the troops here at Incheon and causes, uh, as you'll see here, the North Koreans to retreat. Okay, um, so the UN, um, when, when their troops land there, there's this massive retreat by North Korean troops. I mean, again, uh, compared to the United States military, which again is coming off of like its World War II high of strength, um, the United States just makes remarkable progress in the Korean War. And you can kind of see that here on the map over here. And Truman goes ahead and he gives MacArthur um, permission to, he says, MacArthur, go ahead take all of North Korea, reunify it. But he says, with one little caution, uh, a big caution, uh, do not go too far north. And the reason why he says that is because of the country that is just north of North Korea, and that is China. 
and he tells he tells MacArthur, do not go too far north. You will cause the Chinese to freak out. You will cause China to enter the war. Now, because MacArthur, one of the things you'll learn about him is that he's quite a hothead and he does not listen, uh, he pushes all the way to the Yalu River, which is the border of China. And then, because, again, he didn't listen, when it goes all the way to the border, um, he did not take Truman's warning seriously. And, well, I'll, I'll hold you on a cliffhanger there. So summarize what's happened so far before we go on, okay? Just to make sure that you completely understand. All right, once you've done that then, we can go ahead and jump off the cliffhanger here. And that is 260, uh, 260,000 Chinese troops are going to then enter on the side of North Korea. And the UN gets thrown back all the way across the 38th parallel. And this is where you really do see that like MacArthur's personality as a hothead and like not listening to Truman um, like is just on full display. He goes to Truman and he, he says, I want right now 34 nukes on the table ready to use against Chinese cities. And Truman looks at him and is like, you've got to be absolutely kidding me. There's no way I'm doing that. We're not like, and again, Truman is the guy who dropped the bombs on Japan. And Truman says, we are absolutely not doing that. That is not happening. And, he, and the reason why Truman says this for multiple other reasons is that at this time, um, won't be always this way in the future, is that China is best friends with Russia. They're both communist countries at this point. They're really closely allied. Truman's like, you're an absolute freaking idiot. We're never doing this. Now, MacArthur, in his infinite wisdom, decides to do what you should never do as a U.S. military commander unless you, you know, are not interested in keeping your job. And he goes out full, like, open to the press. Truman won't give me the toys that I want to play with. And, uh he gets dismissed for this rightly so he does get replaced by a general matthew ridgeway who very conveniently um you know well you know or coincidentally uh same same last name as me but it not related at all just you know just just to put that out there um so anyways with, with that being said and truman uh you know tossing uh macarthur out of the picture um once you and troops get pushed back to the 38th parallel there really is no per se winning from this point the, the war just kind of stalemates um and truman uses that opportunity to ask for an armistice in the war which again is just a pause in the fighting now the negotiations to end the korean war never actually happen um and that armistice that paused the war in um uh, in the 1950s is still in place today so technically this is the longest running u.s war of all time because it never actually has actually ceased okay um, so just kind of an interesting, you know, uh, little factoid there. All right. So, uh, at the end of the lesson, just to make sure that you're good on, you know, everything that happened, um, I'd like you to put the events in order by, you know, labeling these, uh, six over here, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so I've given you a little bit of a challenge cause I've mixed them up. So let's see if you can, um, get them into the right order. Okay. Uh, so from there. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look then at some of the modern problems that North Korea faces and causes. Because again, the Kim families, they're, they're still going to be left in charge. Um, and so there's a video right over here that explains some of the problems that North Korea faces and some of the problems that North Korea causes. And even though this video was last updated, I think at the end of the Obama administration, it's, it's still very much, um, very much up to date because even with the first Trump administration, um, and then the Biden administration afterwards, the dynamic really between the United States and, and, uh, and, and North Korea never really shifted in any meaningful way. Um, so uh, I'd like you to write an answer here on this slide um, on Pear Deck to this question. So what problem do you think causes the most difficulty when thinking of what to do with North Korea, at least from the perspective of the United States? Okay. Um, excellent. So now we get to take a little bit of a trip back to looking at nationalism. So there are many, many um, good examples that we can study about how nationalism kind of manifests on the Korean Peninsula. And that is because, uh, again, for both North Korea and South Korea, there's a lot at stake, right? Like having, you know, like a really, you know, cohesive identity, um, you know, that is that is tied into um, you know, your, your nation state is really, really important. 
So again, just a quick reminder from our nationalism lesson that we had a few months ago. Um, you know, nationalism is something, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an imagined identity, right? So it's, it's stuff made up of like, you know, your common language, your territory, your culture, you know, a shared history, um, economic interests. It's kind of this, um, you know, untouchable bond or, you know, uh, that, that everybody has. So with that all being said, what you're going to do here is I have a bracket here for you of different examples of nationalism on the Korean peninsula. And what I would like you to do in a little bit of kind of a March Madness style is I would like you to rank which ones you think are the stronger examples of nationalism. And so I have here uh, a whole list of different things and how you can learn about them is by clicking on them. Okay, so if you click on them, you can read about it. And then if you think that North Korean haircuts are a stronger example of nationalism than BTS, uh, then you can simply take uh, your little uh, you know, keyboard and make a copy of this. So just control C and then control V to paste. If you have an Apple or a Mac, then it's a little bit different. And you can just drag that one up uh, in the bracket. And you'll just repeat this. Okay, so you'll read about all of these on the left-hand side and then all of them on the right-hand side. Trust me, there's lots of like really cool, interesting examples here. Some you might have heard of, some you might not have about um, you know, different things going on in the Koreas all the way until you feel like you have one versus one. And it could be you end up with you know one North Korean uh, example of nationalism versus another North Korean example of nationalism. Um, and then you end up with uh, what you think is the strongest example of nationalism on the Korean peninsula. Um, and you can define that however you want to. And then you just all you need to do on this slide is then tell me how this shows or demonstrates nationalism, okay? You will turn this entire bracket in as a PDF on Brightspace when you're done, okay? And you'll just submit it there. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see what people come up with as thinking their, their strongest rankings uh, is or are, okay? So with that, um, that is it for this lesson. And we will be actually jumping into a new topic um, in uh, our next one. So see you guys later.